Sure, you can go, Felipe. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the UNBC Social Sciences Forum. I am Felipe Filomeno, Associate Director of the Center for Social Science Scholarship. We coordinate this annual lecture series. This is our second Social Sciences Forum Lecture of the Year, and we have many co-sponsors for this talk in particular. I want to thank the Department of Political Science, the Department of Gender, Women's, and Sexuality Studies, the Community Leadership Graduate Program, the Office of Equity and Inclusion, the Latinx and Hispanic Faculty Association, and Black Girls Vote for supporting this event. Before we begin, I want to mention our next talk on November 10th at 6 p.m. Dr. Joseph Richardson of the University of Maryland College Park will deliver the 43rd annual Du Bois Lecture. He will present Life After the Gunshot, Structural Violence, Interpersonal Violence, and Trauma Among Young Black Men in Washington, D.C. This will also be a virtual lecture open to the public. You can find more information on our website, socialscience.umbc.edu. I also invite you to engage with us on social media. We are on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at UMBC Social Site. We also have a new podcast called Retrieving the Social Sciences, and our latest episode features this year's winner of the Nobel Prize in Economics, David Card. A few housekeeping details before we move forward. All attendees will be muted with video off for this lecture, but we welcome your comments and questions for the speaker. Just put those in the chat box at any point and we will do our best to get to them during the Q&A. Thank you again for being here with us today, and I will now turn things over to Nike Robinson, founder of Black Girls Vote. Thank you, Felipe. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Nike, Nike Robinson, and as Felipe said, I'm the founder and CEO of Black Girls Vote. A little over five years ago, we started this journey with Black Girls Vote. If someone would have told me 20 years ago that I would be working um, in a politics leading a nonprofit organization, I would have said, no way. But this is truly a labor of love. We've been so fortunate over the last few years to be out in the community, engaging, educating, and empowering women, particularly Black women, young Black women, to get involved in the political process. And I am so honored that today we are here to share more about our journey. Last year in 2020, you know, like many organizations, we had to pivot in the midst of a pandemic, like many of you had to do. And last year, we created a phenomenal program called Party at the Mailbox. And since then, we have been able to partner with NTOC and other organizations across the country to bring this award-winning program again, all over the country. And it could not have been done with the leadership and the guidance and evaluation with Dr. Michelson, who's here with us today. So I'm so honored and excited to be here and partner with UMBC and so many others to share not only the work of Black Girls Vote and what we have done, but also the work that we're looking to do in the future as building the Black Girls Vote Research Network. So again, thank you for having me. Thank you for being here. And it's such an honor to be here and share so many phenomenal things and the things that we learned along the way. With that being said, I will pass it back to Felipe, who will introduce our next speaker. That will be our Dean, uh, Kimberly Milpet. Good afternoon. Um, I have the honor of introducing Dr. Melissa Michelson, um, who is a nationally recognized expert on Latino politics, voter mobilization experiments, and LGBTQ rights. Um, she is the award-winning author of six books, including one entitled Mobilizing Inclusion, Transforming the Electorate Through Get Out the Vote Campaigns, and then most recently, Transforming Prejudice, Identity, Fear, and Transgender Rights. In her spare time, she knits and runs marathons. Dr. Michelson is currently Dean of Arts and Sciences and a professor of political science at Menlo College. Her academic work is solidly based in activist scholarship, whether the focus is on members of the Latino, LGBTQ, or other marginalized groups, she uses her research to motivate greater equality and justice for all. Dr. Michelson went to graduate school to become a teacher and delights in leading classroom discussions, but also to write books that might make a difference. Inspired by her undergraduate professor at Columbia University, Dr. Charles V. Hamilton. 
She has since written six books and dozens of journal articles and book chapters and is a nationally recognized expert in Latinx voter mobilization and LGBTQ politics. Um, and true to what her bio te tells us, Dr. Michelson, in fact, does walk the walk. And my opportunity to see that was in working with her on this project with Black Girls Vote and the phenomenal program of Party at the Mailbox in last year's election campaign. Um, and so this is a joy to be able to hear her work come to fruition and to see what that relationship with Black Girls Vote introduces to us. So I'm really looking forward to hearing um, what she has to share with us. So thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you. So I am really excited to be here to tell you all more about this fantastic project. Hearing you read my bio reminds me that now that I'm a dean, I don't actually have any more free time and I have not run a marathon since becoming dean. So I think we all know what's going on here. I want to tell you about Party at the Mailbox. So um, you can tell from the title of the presentation what this is about, right? We are mobilizing black voters with celebrations of community. So that's really the, the motivating spirit behind these, right? Um, celebrating community and that leading to turnout. So I want to, well, now I got to move my mousey over here. Okay, I want to start by giving a shout out to the members of my evaluation team. These are my co-authors on the work um, as we've been moving forward. Dr. Ashley C.J. Daniels received her PhD from Howard University. She is now working as a postdoctoral fellow affiliated with Party at the Mailbox and funded by the um, ACLS, the American Conference of Learned Societies. I also have working with me Sarah Hayes, who's a PhD student at Georgetown University and Steph DeMora, who's a PhD student at UC Riverside. So this is really the core team. There's actually a much bigger team of dozens of scholars that have been working on this, in, including Dean Moffitt, that have been part of making sure that we're doing a robust evaluation that's really grounded in uh, literature and also uh, attentive to the communities in which we're working. So. Uh, as Nike said, as we moved around the country to different cities, we would bring on to the team folks who were in those cities so that they would have the cultural competence to help us do the study in those cities. Um, but these women are my core team um, that I talk to like a lot. So the motivation for this project, as Nike mentioned, came from the need to pivot because of the pandemic, right? Everyone's getting ready to vote in the 2020 primaries, and now all of a sudden, it's not really as safe to do so in the traditional manner of going to your local polling place. And so Baltimore switches to an all-male ballot election, and Nike decides this is an opportunity to try something new to get out the vote. Right, and the poster says it all. I love Baltimore, so I vote. Again, this idea was to celebrate community, to celebrate being uh, part of the city of Baltimore, and that that should lead folks to go and participate. It's grounded, though, in a thing called election festivals that some other scholars have been testing since 2005. They started with a small experiment in Hookset, New Hampshire, and then another one in New Haven, and then branched out to do it hundreds of times. And the idea is that they were doing randomized controlled trials, RCTs, which means that they are doing a treatment and a control. So this is very much like a medical trial which I think we're all a lot more familiar with these days because we're all talking about vaccines. So the idea is you have a pool of potential participants, you randomly divide it up. One group is the treatment and one group is the control. So for a vaccine trial, right, the treatment group gets the real vaccine, the control group gets a fake vaccine, right? For party at the mailbox or party at the polls, 
uh, so sorry, for party at the polls, they would take two potential precincts at which to host a party and then randomly assign one to have a party and one doesn't get a party. And then they would throw these parties at the treatment polling places. They'd put up a tent, they'd have a DJ with music, they'd have free food, maybe a cotton candy machine, they'd have hot dogs and hamburgers, and they would advertise this party all over the precinct, right? And maybe that was uh, pieces of mail delivered to people or social media, advertisements in the local paper. And so people heard, hey, on this day during voting hours, there's gonna be a little free party with food and celebration. And, and so folks would go to these parties and they'd sit and eat and talk and dance. Um, <clears throat> and overall, they found, hey, this really works, right? Bringing people together to celebrate their neighborhood. And if that happens to be right next to a polling place, that increases participation. So party at the mailbox is kind of similar to and inspired by these election festivals that have been held between 2005 and 2018. But of course, you can't have an election festival if it's a vote by mail election. So we are doing RCTs, right? We are definitely doing the, you know, gold standard evaluation method, but the evaluation also included many other components. We did surveys in every city where we asked people to respond to an online Qualtrics survey and give us feedback about the program and, and how they felt about it. We also did interviews with local voters and organizers from these partner organizations that Nike and her team were working with to conduct the effort. And then we also had Zoom focus groups where, again, we invited people in these communities to talk to us and share how they felt about voting, how they felt about party at the mailbox and what kinds of other effects we could see so in the RCT, we can measure whether turnout goes up, but in these other methods of collecting data, we can see how did it make people feel? Did it make them feel prouder of being a member of their community? Did it enhance their feelings of identity as voters? Did it make them feel like they had higher levels of political efficacy? And so we can really get at all the different ways in which we think party the mailbox was affecting people. Our work is also very much grounded in studies of um, how black communities in particular think about voting and have uh, feelings of linked fate. And so the idea that for black Americans, voting is something that you do as black people together, that it's something that you do to support your black community, that it's not just about you, but that it's about uh, your community. We are also very much building on that literature. Um, many of you are probably familiar with Souls to the Polls, which is a great example of this, right? The idea that black folks go to their place of worship on Sundays, and then immediately afterwards, they walk to an early voting location. And so they've come together to celebrate community in um, a more religious way, and then they're going and celebrating community in a more secular way. But it's also, uh, it's all part of the same idea of being a member of this black community and coming together to support one another. As you can see from the sites there, there's a lot of work on this that we're linking to. Uh, there's not a lot of work to link to when it comes to what do we know as scholars about how to increase black voter turnout. There just aren't a lot of RCTs out there. Uh, part of this is because scholars just aren't that interested. Um, black voters are not really swing voters. They don't tend to be in swing states. And so, you know, in, in contrast to the Latinx vote, which there's a lot more interest in how do you get out the Latinx vote because they're considered a swing vote and can decide the outcome of elections. Uh, that's not really the case for Black Americans. And then importantly, there's also a 
pretty rational reluctance on the side of black communities to not be experimented on, right? Just that word, you know, hey, we wanna do an experiment uh, with you. That's um, off-putting, right? So we actually don't tend to use that word when we're talking to partners and we're talking to uh, local residents. We talk about doing research. We talk about doing an evaluation of a program. Um, but, you know, given the way that black people have been exploited by science, they don't wanna be experimented on. And so um, that's part of why there's not as much published, published research on this. It's not that black serving organizations and um, communities don't know how to get out the vote, right? That's not what I'm trying to say. There's tons of community knowledge out there. There's tons of institutional knowledge out there. It's just not in the political science scholarship. We don't have books and papers about it. Um, so people know what works and they do it, but we don't have the proof, right? Uh, a lot of times I characterize my work as proving what we already know, but with math, right? A lot of folks already know how to get out the black vote, but we don't have the math to back it up. And so um, that's where there's the, the lack of scholarship. So we go into the field expecting that this party at the mailbox idea that Nike comes up with is going to create a celebratory community. Um, it's going to make people feel a stronger feeling of political efficacy. It's going to make them feel more a member of their community and a stronger identity as voters. And it's going to make them more likely to vote. So these are the hypotheses, see, hypotheses we have going in. And you're probably like, okay, you've told us all this cool stuff about Party of the Mailbox, but what is the Party of the Mailbox exactly? So let me tell you what Party of the Mailbox is. It's a box of stuff that people got, mostly educational materials. You can't really see that in this photo, um, but then also celebratory things, a poster that says, I love Baltimore, so I vote. Um, a coloring book and crayons to get younger members of the household involved. A noisemaker, balloons, a t-shirt that says Baltimore votes, right? local treats like these burger cookies, which I'm not really from Baltimore, but I'm assuming y'all are like, oh yeah, burger cookies, right? And so that's part of Nike's brilliance on this is that every box for every city we went to, she's like, this is the thing that goes in the box, right? So if you wanted to get a box, you had to sign up. So, um, that is part of the reason that there's all these community partners, right? And so they would say to people, hey, there's this thing going on, go to this website and sign up. And we had people put in um, their name and address in their birth year. We were careful to try to not ask for too much personal information, like just the bare minimum so we can vet, match them to the voter file because we don't want to freak people out that we're asking for all kinds of details about their identities. And then once we got those lists, we, we, I mean, the grad students, the grad students matched them to the voter file and then we randomized. And so we had, here are the people in the treatment group, they're gonna get a box. And here are the people in the control book group, they asked for a box, but we're not giving them one, right? Um, and so you can, uh, you can imagine there was a lot of uh, people who wanted to get one of these boxes. There were also activities that weren't part of the box um, there was a car caravan, um, something, again, a lot of you are probably familiar with. So West Baltimore had a, a 40 car caravan that drove through the neighborhood and Nike's voice was going out over the, uh, the loudspeaker, encouraging people to vote. There was an election night dance party on Facebook that got, uh, over 10,000 viewers. Um, and I'll show you a screenshot of that in a couple of slides. And so, um, even if you didn't get a box, you could be part of this, right? And I'll say some more about that in a minute. Uh, but first I wanna note that this project got a lot of both, uh, got a lot of earned media. And um, that's, to, it, for those of you not familiar with that jargon, there's, there's earned media and there's paid media. So if you pay to advertise, right? Then that's money out the door to let people know what you're doing. 
earned media means it's free. Um, so, you know, when WBAL comes and does a story about Party at the Mailbox, Party at the Mailbox didn't have to pay for that publicity, but obviously that media coverage puts a lot of folks on the website, right? Uh, draws a lot of attention to the program. And um, I'm not gonna play the little video, but it's really a pretty cool little news segment and you get to see like um, people putting together the boxes and talking about it. There was also um, coverage here um, with our beautiful poster in, in the background. Um, there was coverage in ethnic media, um, including um, this website. So a lot of earned media. And again, Nike was working really hard to get the word out about this happening, right? And so getting earned media, um, connecting with influencers so that they would post on social media about the boxes, just really driving all sorts of traffic to the website to sign people up. and and to let people know about it, even if they didn't sign up. And as I mentioned, there was this enormously popular election night party. Uh, there are these three local DJs who provided music. Um, the speaker of the Baltimore House of Delegates came by, the, the uh, Reverend Jesse Jackson came by. Um, and so it was just this huge um, party of people celebrating voting. Um, safely from the comfort of their homes without having to go out, um, but just um, celebrating nevertheless. So we wanted to know, okay, did this work? So right now I'm focusing on the pilot, which is the June 2020 primary in the city of Maryland. We are doing our quantitative analysis using validated turnout data that we get uh, from the state. And then we're also doing this qualitative analysis to make sure that we got lots of people answering our survey, coming to the, to the focus groups, we gave them Amazon gift cards. And um, we did use local folks in Baltimore, like Dean Moffitt, to uh, conduct this evaluation. So let me first tell you what happened with the validated turnout data. And before I go there, I wanna give you a definition of who's at these parties, right? So a traditional party at your house, you're the host and you also have your guests. So we are labeling as hosts, the people who signed up to get a box. We have treatment group hosts and control group hosts. And then we have the guests at the party. And here we're defining that as anybody else in your household. So for example, if I'm the party host, I went to the website, I asked for a box, box came to my house, woohoo! I open up the box and then everybody in my household gets to enjoy it. So yesterday, the Richmond, Virginia box came to the house. My husband said, ooh, cookies, right? My kids said, ooh, potato chips. Like, hey, what else is in this box? And so everybody in the household interacted with the box and with the materials. And so the idea here is, even if you didn't know about party at the mailbox, once that box shows up at your house, now you're in the treatment group, right? Because now you're like, oh, let me look at all this material that came in this box, right? Okay, so hosts and guests. And so what we're really um, fabulously impressed by when we look at the data is how much party at the mailbox increased the turnout of guests, right? not particularly surprising, the people who asked for a box, they tend to be high propensity voters. You can see there are only 46 people in this pilot that asked for a box who we would classify as low propensity voters, meaning they had less than a 50% likelihood of voting. Almost everyone who asked for a box, whether they're in the treatment or control group, they're high propensity. And so there's just not a lot of room for their turnout to go higher, right? they're already voting, right? In the high 80s, low 90s percentages. But the guests, right? The people who interacted with this box without expecting it to show up, that's where we really see the movement. That it is particularly low propensity guests where we are seeing the increase in turnout. And while that was not exactly what we expected, it is so logical, right? So after the pilot, we're like, yes, of 
course, it's the guests. It's not the people signing up. And it's the lower propensity people who this is going to impact the most. And you can see that illustrated really lovely in this, um, in this figure, right? So you can see as your vote propensity decreases from 100% to zero, the effect of getting a box in your household goes up, right? Um, so that is exactly where we're seeing this movement is among low propensity guests. As I mentioned, we also had a survey and you'll see that most of the people who responded to our survey were black women, right? 88% were, were women, 64% uh, were, were black. And even though this is just hosts, right? This is only people who signed up to get a box who we surveyed, we still see that people who reported getting a box in their household were more likely to say they voted and were more likely to say that they identified as a Baltimorean. And this is controlling for all sorts of things like how long they've lived in the city of Baltimore. So what we see is, as hypothesized, that not only is it affecting turnout, it's also affecting their feelings of community as membership in this community. And then here is a still from our focus group and you can see our brilliant focus group host here talking to a group of people, right? And so we do the interviews and the focus groups to get open-ended responses from people and to get conversations going. Uh, Dr. Moffat did the focus group, the focus groups for us for the pilot. And so that's a, a huge part of the data. And so I wanna share with you some of the feedback that we got from people when we were interviewing them either one-on-one -on -one or speaking to them in a focus group. And we got a lot of encouraging comments that suggested that exactly what we thought was happening was really happening, right? Um, so even though black women do tend to have pretty high voter turnout, people liked being reminded, kind of like being reminded um, that they matter and also being thanked for being such active voters. And people were posting on social media. And this part is important because people were using the materials we were sending them, the balloons and the posters, to decorate their houses, um, their sidewalk mailboxes, their front doors, their windows. Just a couple of months ago, I was in Baltimore in August, and people still have these signs up. So it's not just that they put them up for the election in June 2020 or maybe November 2020. A year later, folks still have these signs up, right? Because they love Baltimore and, and so they vote. Um, so we got a lot of beautiful social media reminding us that this was happening, right? And that matters because we think this means that it has a spillover effect into the community. You might remember during the pandemic, a lot of folks were going for evening walks just to get out of the house. And a lot of people put like teddy bears in their windows, right? But if you were walking around Baltimore, you also saw the party at the mailbox signs and balloons. And so again, even if you didn't get a box in your household, or even if you didn't even know about party at the mailbox, you would see this stuff as you walked around, right? And so it's helping generate this celebration of community, this feeling of connection to your neighbors, right? Um, that our participants said was just really special, was really valuable to them. Um, here's another really good quote that illustrates this, right? Where this woman even did a, an unboxing video and how it made her feel really connected to other people um, in this time of being isolated and, and sheltering in place, right? Uh, I didn't highlight it, but I started seeing all of my friends, their t-shirts and their feeds and Instagram and everything, like with they're blowing their horn and wearing their t-shirt. So this, this participant was obviously giving us exactly the feedback we wanted, right? But we got this over and over again with people, like it was really celebratory and it was really creating this feeling of connection and community in people. 
And it was true even if they didn't get a box, right? So this person was in the control group. She wanted a box, but we didn't give her one. And still it had this powerful effect on her, right? And feeling like it's encouraging people to vote, to talk about voting, right? S really celebrating what it feels like to vote from home. Um, and so the RCT shows that we had this enormous effect that we increased turnout by low propensity household members by 12.4 percentage points. But I think what we get from the qualitative data in particular is how party at the mailbox affected everybody. And even in ways that you, you maybe can't prove with math, right? That it's creating these feelings among members of the community beyond the fact that more people voted, right? So because it was so fantastic and successful, of course, we wanted to replicate it. And so um, part of the mailbox next went in the fall of 2020 to Baltimore, Detroit, and Philadelphia. And then um, there was some activity on Atlanta for the US Senate runoff. Um, in January, and then, of course, we are also right now in Richmond, Virginia, um, working on turnout for the election that ends on Tuesday. And because more funds were available for these replications, uh, Nike and her team did, in fact, wrap a van. And so now, instead of people in an unmarked car coming to your house to give you the box, it showed up in this wrapped van. and that's also gonna have a spillover effect, right? Because if a van comes to my house and gives me a box, all my neighbors are like looking out the window, like, hey, what's what's that? What's that van? What's let me let me scan that QR code and see what's going on here. Let me Google party the mailbox. Um, and so just again uh, building up the hype and the and the knowledge of this project. And we did a ton more interviews and focus groups. Uh, so as you can see here, um, we've just done an enormous amount of data collection. I can't even tell you what all of this data tells us because my evaluation team is, is trying to both get ready for Richmond and evaluate the data from all these previous rounds. Uh, but as you can see, it's an enormous amount of data. So I guess uh, stay tuned, eventually there'll be a book. And we're gonna just have a whole book because we have so much data and there's so much uh, rich feedback in these interviews and focus groups um, that we're just gonna have to write it all up. So the evaluation continues, um, but I do have some RCT results I can share with you. So for example, in Baltimore for 2020, now keep in mind, this is a general election, right? This is the presidential election of 2020. So you can see in the, control groups, right? The base turnout is much higher. Nevertheless, you can see that we replicate our finding that among low propensity voters, and particularly among who we, the people we are calling our low propensity guests, we increase turnout by 5.2 percentage points. So it's still working even in a presidential election. And I wanna pause on that to make sure I emphasize for y'all how amazing that is. I have literally done hundreds of GOTV RCTs, probably at least 300. They tend to work in low propensity elections, in low salience elections, off-year off elections, right? School board elections, midterm elections, primary elections. But in the heat of a presidential general election, they almost never work because turnout's already so high and there's so much other stuff going on. So getting a party at the mailbox box at your house gets drowned out by all the other stuff you're getting, all the mailers, all the TV ads, all the, right, all the stuff. So it's really very difficult to prove with an RCT that a GOTV effort was successful in a presidential general election. And it's really testament to the strength of the party, the mailbox project. 
that we showed this strong effect in Baltimore, right? Um, Baltimore is maybe not as high propensity, though, as some of these other cities. And so while we were active in Detroit and Philly for the November 2020 election, I'm not going to show you the RCTs for those because we have null effects there. We still think we had an effect, right? We see evidence that there was an effect when we look at how people responded to the project, looking at our interview and focus group data. But we can't show that it increased turnout. Um, Probably just everyone in those cities was so highly mobilized that basically the control group is mobilized by some other means. We also don't have an RCT for Atlanta, unfortunately, because of some data issues. But because Atlanta was later, we do have something more interesting to say about Atlanta because by then we had figured out and we had time to get our IRB approval for changing the evaluation strategy to include not only hosts, but guests, right? So remember, hosts are the people who are going to the website and saying, please give me a box. And guests are just people in the household. But we wanted, now that we know that the effect is mostly among guests, we want to get some survey and qualitative data from guests. And so because Atlanta was later in January 2021, we were able to change our evaluation methods and, and include them. And so we get them participating um, in the post-election evaluations. We find them more likely to report identities as Atlantans, more likely to identify as Americans, and maybe most importantly, more likely to identify as voters. They give us higher, stronger feelings of political efficacy. And so all this stuff that we thought is going on among guests, we get evidence of that in our surveys. And then we also see in the surveys that hosts report that if they get the box, they're more likely to be mobilizing other people, right? Which again, totally makes sense. You get the box, it's like an excuse, like, hey, check out this box of stuff I got. Hey, check out this poster. Hey, do you wanna draw in this coloring book? And now everybody in the household is talking about voting, right? It's a, it's a catalyst for those conversations. When we look at our qualitative data, our interviews and our focus groups, here's where we start to get the themes that are coming out about community and duty to community. So um, now we're really getting an understanding of the mechanism by which part of the mailbox is having all these effects on people's attitudes and behaviors. So we find that the box again, is creating these new avenues of communication to talk to other people, that it created this idea or reinforced this idea as voting as a community effort, as making people feel part of their local communities. And part of that was because, as I mentioned, Nike and her team made, took so much care to make the boxes feel local, that they had local items in them, right? That they, um, that they felt like this is something local. This is not some national organization parachuting in and telling us what to do. This is us, right? Um, we find a lot of evidence that the media campaign was successful, that people heard about it and heard, um, heard about it in a way that made them excited about voting, especially through social media, and really understood it as a message about, I'm part of this community and I want to go out and vote as a member of this community, right? So really uh, thinking about it now as part of the mailbox encourages voting as a celebration of community, right? Um, and again, you can see this in the focus group and interview data. So I'll just give you a couple more of these beautiful pieces of feedback that we got with people, right? Um, in November, uh, this voter said, it said it was happening in other cities, but it also felt very local. You know, it felt very local because you had those local items there, like the tasty cake, right? And so um, the, the treat that came in the box was local and people felt like, yeah, this is something we're doing as, I can't remember which city tasty cakes is, maybe it's Philadelphia, but whatever city it was is like, yes, this is our city and we're celebrating and we're eating tasty cakes, right? 
um, this participant in Baltimore, they got the box in June and then they asked for one again in November and they didn't get it. And they didn't seem that upset about it, right? They just loved the box, putting it up in my mailbox. Kids love the coloring book. Just felt like, wow, like celebration. Like I'm a part of something bigger too. It's not just like this one person, but like there's all these other people that are getting this and experiencing this or liking this experience as a collective. That was pretty awesome. This is exactly what we wanted people to think. And here's evidence from this uh, individual that it's that it's really working. And as I mentioned, when we went back around the neighborhood in August, when I had an opportunity to come to UMBC and meet with Nike and other folks, uh, we drove around with Sam Novi, and there are all these people with signs still up, right, uh, of people celebrating this um, event that had long passed, right? Um, and this is just one example. I have a whole bunch of photos of this that um, it's just so amazing that these are still up. So overall, what we take away from the qualitative data is that people are voting as a celebration of community and also as a sense of duty to their communities, right? Um, and we traditionally think about the feeling of a duty to vote among Black Americans as more of this, this third one here, right? The duty to the Black ancestors who fought for the right to vote, right? Or maybe um, the duty to, to have your voice heard, right? That, that you have to vote because that's how you make things happen. Uh, but we also got people talking about voting as a way to show that they care for their community. So again, this very collective feeling about voting that we think is unique to Black communities and something that echoes the Black politics literature about things like uh, linked fate. So that is the fabulous Party of the Mailbox project and all the evaluation that we're doing. Um, thanks to Nike's fantastic idea and the work of dozens of dozens of people. Um, and I'm ready to take some questions. Great, thank you for that wonderful presentation. I'm Candace Dotson Reed. I am Chief of Staff to the President at UMBC and also the Executive Director of the Office of Equity and Inclusion, which is one of the sponsors, and was really excited to be able to participate uh, with this awesome group of people. Um, I encourage everyone to start to submit questions in the chat if you have any questions. We did have one that came up, and then I have a couple that I will ask as well. The one that came up is Could you please explain? RCT. They were not yeah. familiar with the acronym. Yeah, no problem. So an RCT is randomized controlled trial. And it's random, which means people are randomly assigned to treatment and control. Uh, but it's it's controlled. So everything else about people is the same. So um, you know, you want to make sure that everybody in the treatment group is kind of a parallel to everyone in the control group. And so that it's not some other factor, right? If you put all the likely voters in the treatment group, then, right, that doesn't work. Uh, so if you take a pool of people and you randomly assign them and it's balanced, then if you do something only to the treatment group and then you look to see what outcome you get, whether that's did the person vote, how does the person feel about voting, how does the person feel about um, anything, really, you can attribute the difference between treatment and control to the treatment. So treatment folks here get a box and control folks don't. Thank you. I have a question for both of you. We may return to in-person voting in 2022 in Maryland, um, but you know we'll still have the option to vote by mail. Any thoughts given your success on continuing uh, this, uh, this wonderful initiative? I could you want to talk about that? Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. And so what we're learning along the way is that we're going to have to pivot um, in any situation. So what we're promoting this box is a voter education box. So whether you're going to vote in person, what we saw some people last year in the general election, they decided to vote in person. But what was really cool is they wore their t-shirts, right? They wore their t-shirts, maybe a kid had on the button, people had their signs and their posters. So it still felt like a family affair. So our goal is to continue to educate voters because more importantly in the boxes, 
education about voting, right? Important dates and deadlines, locations, all the things that you may not know, which is um, reassurance and also um, hotlines. You know, if you have questions with the state board of elections, that information is there as well. So our goal is to continue um, to do it, whether you're voting by mail or not, but saying, hey, each election season, you should have pride in your community um, and let people know that, hey, I'm excited to vote. I'm a proud member of this community. And as a proud member, I do vote. Yeah, I think there's plenty of potential for this to work in a regular face to face election. And as as Nike noted, we saw people doing that in the fall. I think that it's called party at the mailbox can just mean that the party comes in the mail. It doesn't have to mean that you vote by mail. Right? Um, and so for Richmond, we are mailing the boxes instead of having them delivered by a van. And so we really are, um, you know, still having it be a party at your mailbox, but now. Probably a lot of folks in Richmond will be voting in person and pretty sure it's still going to work. Excellent. I live in Howard County and I'm trying to figure out how I can get my box in Howard County. <laughs> a question that came in the, uh, in the chat is how do these findings compare to findings from Latinx samples? Um, yeah, so the, uh, we've never done anything like this in terms of trying to get out the Latinx vote. I have done hundreds of experiments in how to get out the Latinx vote, and we've tried lots of different things, but nobody ever tried sending a box of educational materials along with some tasty treats. I would like to think that it would work, but I don't know, right? Because the Latinx community is different from the black community. And, you know, as scholars, we wanna be careful to not assume that what works for one identity group is gonna work for another. Um, that's actually, Kind of one of the problems with get out the vote research is that a lot of folks take what happens uh, works for white people and then they just try to duplicate it in communities of color and it it really just doesn't work the same um but in terms of the effect size this is a really strong effect size i mean we are talking about a project that increases voter turnout more than most door-to-door -door canvassing efforts right and door-to-door -door canvassing is Y'all probably know one of the most powerful, well proven strategies for getting out the vote because it's personal, right? It's somebody coming to your door and saying, Hey, Candace, I'm here at your house talking to you because you're an important voice and I want to make sure you vote. And that personal connection that folks feel when you come to their house, especially if you're a member of a historically excluded community, like a Latinx voter, and you've been told voting's not for you, you're not welcome, but now somebody's at your house saying, Hey, you're welcome, you're invited, please come vote, you're important, has a huge effect. So the big effects we're getting from doing door to door in Latinx communities, Nike's party the mailbox is getting from delivering a box of stuff to people's door. And they're not having a conversation, they're just delivering the box and saying, okay, cool man, have a nice day. Like, it's still personal, but it's just so different. Um, so, it compares very well, I guess is what I want to say. It compares very, very well. And the very few studies we do have of getting out black turnout, this also compares really very well. So um, enormously successful. Thank you. Have you had the opportunity to speak with any elected officials about, uh, about the effort and what was their feedback if you have? Um, I'll start. So some elected officials actually uh, requested the box and got the box, which is really cool. As Dr. Michelson said, um, Speaker of the House, um, Adrian Jones joined our virtual party, as well as, um, you know, Senator Ferguson, um, who's president of the Senate. He joined, he got a box. And so people love the boxes and love the branding in it. You know, we even got requests from some local elected officials say, hey, can we get a Maryland box, right? Can we get a, you know, I love Maryland, so I vote. And so there's been a lot of requests and a lot of interest because no one has gotten the box. And what we hear is that, one, um, people invited this into their home. And oftentimes people get literature and literature and things they don't want, but this is something that they do want. People say, oh, who loves a you know, free t-shirt? So a lot of elected officials either got the box or they saw the box. And as Dr. Michelson said, in Baltimore, we did a lot 
of great promoting, got a lot of earned media. And it really was during the time, you know, people were at home. People were like, what are we going to do? You know, and so you may have seen it. I know, Candace, you're in Baltimore. Hopefully you saw the boxes, right? And people posting the boxes and things like that on social media within our network. Um, but yes, yeah, some elected officials did receive the boxes. They had to request it um, just like anyone else. And then they loved it as well. That's really great. Mm -hmm. I, I love the community building piece of this as well. Um, another question that came in is, how do you decide which cities to target? Has there, uh, have you made a decision yet uh, for the 2022 midterms? So right now we're, we're, we're building a case for funding. You know, I know someone asked, but you know, cars per box and it varies in our primary election in 2020, the boxes range anywhere from 50 to $60, right? And I say that, let's say Under Armour itself donated masks for all the boxes. Um, over 10,000 masks and they are $30 each, right? Um, however, uh, for our Richmond evaluation, we're doing something a little different. We said, hey, how can we scale it down with costs? And so not only do we have a box, we introduced the sleeve um, to the program. And the sleeve is um, a scaled down version. It's an envelope that you may get your packages in and it has a t-shirt, some signs. It's not as elaborate as the box. And we're like, hey, let's see if the t-shirt and the sleeve have more of an impact. And if so, can we get that cost down to roughly anywhere between 10 and $15 per sleeve? Um, and so it's really, really our pilot enrichment, as Dr. Michelson said, is a little different where we're sending the boxes out randomly to voters and hoping that, you know, the effect will be just as impactful. And then with that being said, funders and people who are looking to go into different cities um, may invest in certain cities. But in 2020, we had people who were interested in Philadelphia, Detroit, and wanted us to mobilize there and people were interested in Atlanta and access to mobilize there. So it varies. And Baltimore being our hometown, myself and Sam Novi, who was my partner in crime, we're like, we have to do it in Baltimore, not only for the primary, but for the general as well. Thanks for that. We did have one comment uh, that came in that said, I would like to see this effort focus um, on Baltimore City High Schools or some similar effort to create a culture of voting. Do you want to comment on that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, the sky's not the limit. You know, I tell people we started the sky, but it takes time. You know, everything doesn't happen overnight. As I said, within a year in the middle of a pandemic, we did six evaluations and that's huge. And Dr. Michelson is very modest, but, you know, she's gotten awards for part of the mailbox. You know, this wasn't a part of our 2020 plan, right? When we were like, what are we going to do in 2020? Um, but to see it come on and take on its own life, it's been an absolutely very rewarding and amazing thing. But as you can imagine, we have a small team and it, it takes capacity, it takes funding, but absolutely it'll be a great thing to get more students involved and more engaged. And um, they too would love the box. It's something that, you know, that everyone can share with their family. And they feel like it's, a, some people feel like it's um, a gift, even though we know it's not a gift, it's education. Um, so absolutely that's something we would love to do in the future. But again, it all comes down to resources and capacity. Dr. Michael, any thoughts add? <laughs> I need I need to add um, we are still doing research on humans and there's a lot of rules about that and ethical considerations and it is more complicated to do research with people who are children and so if you're talking about high school students you are talking about children and there's actually quite a lot of institutional hurdles for doing so so I think it's a great idea I think it's potentially very impactful but the making it happen would actually be more challenging than just resources. It would be making sure that we could get approval um, and that we, you know, we got the ethical thumbs up and, you know, parents would probably have to be consulted and school board, like it's harder to do research with children. And so uh, there's that consideration as well. And the last question I see coming in right now is, um, and you touched on this a bit, if we return to in-person voting, would it make sense to com combine party at the polls with party at the mailbox? I'm um, talking about I'm this. Sure what, the, what the organization party at the polls is doing now, um, but I always think there's always an opportunity to partner and or expand um, just the work we're doing because people love to party, people love to celebrate. So. Um, there absolutely could be a potential partnership, um, but you know we don't know what the future holds. I think beyond a partnership, though, and one thing we did talk about, if I remember correctly, is what if we gave people the boxes, like people have their boxes and their T-shirts, and then we organize something where people go to their polling place 
and now there's a party at the mailbox like there's a place to take a selfie or there's you know that it's somehow the party continues right and so not necessarily a partnership with the precinct parties groups that are that are doing that but that party at the mailbox would encourage people to go to their local polling place wearing their shirt um and then celebrating together and maybe there would be you know food or other celebratory things um that's potentially a way to magnify the effect of the party at the mailbox materials and experience it's also as y'all might imagine more expensive more logistically challenging but in theory totally makes sense that that would work right you get the stuff in your house you're talking about voting with your household members you're walking around your community you're seeing the signs and the balloons and then on election day you go to your local polling place and there's your neighbors wearing their shirts holding their signs and you're celebrating together of course that would work right uh but at the same time i think the direction we're going as a country at least here in California, I don't know what y'all are doing in Baltimore, but the, we're going all mail voting all the time. And I think more and more people now that they've tried it are like, oh yeah, I can just vote by mail. I don't have to find time. Like some people really like that feeling that they get of voting in person. But um, I think the trend for election administrators is to encourage more and more absentee voting and to just make that more convenient and um, and then you can vote when you have time. And so, you know, how much effort do we want to put into replicating that at the polling plot place festival experience to magnify the effect of the party at the mailbox boxes when the trend from my perspective is moving away from in person voting? Uh, maybe that's not true in Baltimore, but certainly true here. Thank you so much, Melissa and Nike. I know we've got about three minutes left. And with that, I will turn it back over to Felipe. Hi, everyone. So thank you so much for coming. Uh, this uh, will be available in the future in our podcast. Uh, so I encourage you to subscribe and later share this great talk that we've had uh, with within your networks. Uh, I'm really glad we had a talk that demonstrates how scientific rigor and community engagement can be combined in a great way. And this is what we do at UMBC. So uh, it was great to learn from this experience. Thank you, Melissa. And thank you to everyone else who participated. And thank you, Felipe thank you. and the UMBC team for having us. We're super duper excited um, about the future. And we want to continue the conversation, right? Because it's not a perfect program we're learning. And we would love to hear from many of you about ways that you think that we can improve the program. So stay tuned for more information about our next conversation and things that we can do um, and learn from you all. So again, thank you so much to the UMBC team um, and Dr. Michelson and everyone who supported Party at the Mailbox um, and Black Girls Vote. So truly an honor. Bye everyone. Bye everyone. Bye.